Hear me out. Before you marry someone, wouldn't you want to know if they carry a significant amount of debt? Or even better, if they have a ton of money? As an accredited financial counselor, I would love it if they incorporated financial conversations somewhere in the show Love is Blind in the lead up to getting married. Because not only would it make for some juicy drama and content, but in reality, I think it would help set up the couple for a greater chance of success. Financial compatibility is a part of compatibility. So in this video, I'm going to talk through some examples in the show where the topic of money came up. Specifically, I want to talk about where I felt like there were some financial red flags. But importantly, not just to gossip here, I want to share my take on what you can do if you come across these flags in your own life. I think that if you're in the dating pool, or even if you already have a partner, it doesn't hurt to learn more about the behavioral side of finance. Money touches almost all aspects of our lives, and it's a sensitive topic for many people. And that could also include you and I. So it doesn't hurt to learn more. For those new here, hello and welcome. My name is Lisa Prudencio. Like I said, I'm an accredited financial counselor. I'm also a trauma of money certified practitioner, and I do specialize in helping people remove their shame and their guilt around money so that they can truly build wealth and improve their quality of life. So before I get to that list of what I think are financial red flags, I wanna touch on the show itself, Love is Blind. So don't watch this video if you don't want spoilers on season seven or on Love is Blind UK. Now, for those of you who've never seen the show but are here anyway, what's up? I don't blame you that you've never seen the show. It's like so bad that it's good. <laughs> the concept is it is an experiment. It's an experiment to see if people can truly fall in love before they know what the other person looks like. They literally, have to get engaged before they can see each other in real life. So what we see on the show is we see these participants going on dates with each other in what are called pods. Basically, they're in their little pods talking to each other through a wall. This is like a 10 day period. And at some point, if they find someone they fall in love with, someone proposes, they get engaged, they meet in person, and then there's a one month or 28 day journey from engagement to the wedding. The couples get to start off their in real life dating on a tropical getaway. Then they go into the real world together where they move in together, they meet each other's friends and family. And of course, for the drama, <laughs> for the tea, they get to meet some of the other people in the pods, including people that they kind of liked but didn't end up picking. Then for the final couple standing who make it to their wedding day, the wedding day still isn't a sure thing. That's when each person is asked to make a decision of I do or I don't. It's a wild show. It's a crazy concept. But during this 38 day fiasco, you can only imagine what it's like when two people, they like each other and they're getting to know each other but it's so accelerated. They're meeting each other's parents, they're moving in together. Now, the thing is, we don't really know what happens off camera. We're basically subject to what the Netflix producers give us until it gets posted on Instagram or leaked somehow. But I just wonder how many financial conversations happen in that 38 day period. Because like I said at the beginning of the video, like, would you really, want to marry someone if you knew they had not just debt because a lot of people have debt but that people are not great with money they don't handle it well or in some cases they have a lot of it and that defines who they are i know some of you guys are like i don't care <laughs> if they have a lot of money it's cool with me all i'm saying is if it were up to me i would add a section of the show where the couple comes in they meet with a financial counselor. I will volunteer to do it if Love is Blind wants to hire me. But basically where the couple meets with a financial counselor or a financial therapist or a family lawyer like to discuss a prenup or some other professional that can help them navigate the financial side of marriage before the two people make that commitment. That's what I think is missing in the show. Now, obviously a reason the show might not do it is one, there's not enough time and two, 
And I don't know, maybe it would make the show more boring if people are more practical about this. Because after all, this show is about seeing if people have an emotional connection. I just think that marriage also obviously has a contractual component to it, a legal component. So I have actually not seen every single season of Love is Blind US, but I've seen a few and I just finished Love is Blind UK and just started Love is Blind Habibi. It's crazy because Actually, I don't watch a lot of unscripted shows. I typically tend to watch scripted shows, but if somebody in my household puts on that first episode and I catch it, I usually get hooked. <laughs> so I've watched enough seasons to know that on occasion, the topic of money does come up and it does become a plot line that they include in the show. So with that, I wanna to touch on a few scenarios in recent seasons where money has come up and in my opinion, why it was a red flag. Let's start out with financial red flag number one, borrowing money. So first off, borrowing money is not inherently bad. In some situations, when a person has to borrow money, they hate to be in that position. They wish they didn't have to ask. It's just that their life and financial circumstances call for it and it's an option for them. In other situations, I've seen people have no respect for another person's boundaries. They'll just keep asking for money, whether to have it or to borrow it. So all I'm saying is typically it helps to have a foundation of mutual trust and mutual respect between two people before you go ahead and open up your wallet. So I think if someone is asking for money, whether that's to borrow or to have, and it's very early on, and you haven't built up that trust and respect, that can be a financial red flag. So meet Monica and Steven in season seven of Love is Blind. So in this most recent season, Monica and Steven end up getting engaged out of the pods, but they didn't end up making it to their wedding, primarily, and the plot line that we saw on the show was because Steven, he couldn't help but send these raunchy texts to other women while he was engaged to Monica. But on top of that, at some point, Steven alluded to being fired from his job. So for him, money was tight. He told that to Monica and Monica actually helped him out. She didn't judge him at all. She said that she'd help out. But what ended up happening is when she caught him cheating and she knew it was over, they were breaking off the engagement, she was not about it. She told him to Venmo her the money back. And for those of you curious like me, <laughs> I don't know how much time I spend looking up these people on the show, but I found out later on from people on the internet that the amount she let him borrow was $400. So that could be a lot to some people and it could be not a lot to others. So what exactly is the red flag here? Why would I think that's a red flag to help out your fiance with money? So again, I don't think borrowing money or helping out your partner or someone you care about is bad. Like if someone lost their job unexpectedly, if someone's going through a hard time, if someone has medical things, if someone has children to take care of, it's understandable. For Monica and Steven specifically, obviously this is kind of an outlier because <laughs> Technically, they were engaged. They were fiancés of each other. I guess in real life though, if you've only known someone a few weeks, it seems to me that asking to borrow money can raise some questions. Something my therapist always used to tell me back in the day was when you're starting to date someone, this is your information gathering phase. You wanna do things with as little judgment as you can, but you want to take note of things. So asking to borrow money very early on can raise some questions. For example, question number one, is this gonna be a pattern? You won't know if it's gonna be a pattern the first time someone asks, but if it becomes a pattern that keeps happening, it can have a negative impact on your relationship. And the thing is, it's hard to know or assume what the root of the issue is, right? It's probably some complex reason that leads someone to ask for money from someone that they hardly know. For example, it can say that a person maybe doesn't handle money responsibly. It could also mean that a person needs some financial guidance and support. Number two, another question that it can bring up is, is there no one else you can ask? 
<laughs> so like I said, this is a nuance for Monica and Steven on Netflix because they are engaged, but let's say Steven actually lost his job during the filming of the show. There were some questions about that, whether or not that was true, but let's say he did. Do you not have anyone else that you can ask? Like someone who might know you a little bit better, who has more of a history with you, a close friend, family member. So again, I don't think there's anything wrong with helping someone you care about, especially for Monica who is looking at him like, this is my fiance, I'm about to spend the rest of my life with him. You know, even though we've only known each other a couple of weeks, we are in this thing together. But what I will say is it could be a red flag if someone is asking you very early on and instead of asking someone else. There's a part of that that might be this person not respecting or acknowledging your own boundaries. And lastly, another question that it can bring up is, do you have a plan? Again, falling on hard times is a part of life. If someone gets to the point where they're relying on you for money or a lifeline, what you wanna know is, do they show signs of wanting to bounce back? Is there gonna be a longer term solution? And are they open to other types of support from you besides financial support? So if you're gonna let people borrow money, obviously do it with people that you have a mutual trust and respect with. It seemed like Monica and Steven had that or were building that, but maybe not. Moving on, financial red flag number two, flexing, AKA money status. Flexing is when people show off about something, it can be anything but oftentimes it is related to money or material things. Oftentimes the point of flexing is to show how much money or status you have or how much power you have. For those of you who watched this same season of Love is Blind that I'm talking about, can you guess who my example is gonna be? <laughs> I'll get to it in a second. But according to Dr. Brad Klontz, a financial psychologist, People have very distinct money scripts. What he calls money scripts is basically your narrative around money. It's how you view money, how you interact with it, and how you view it, like your relationship with money, is usually a result of not just your experiences on a day-to-day -day basis, but your childhood beliefs and experiences. Dr. Klontz specifically believes there are four core money beliefs and that people tend to fall into one of these core beliefs. There's money avoidance, money worship, money vigilance, and money status. So I won't get into all of them, but money status would be very aligned with a person who likes to flex or who tends to flex sometimes without even realizing that's what they're doing. People who seek money status, they tend to link their self-worth with their net worth. So the more dollars in their bank account and their investments, they feel like hot shit. But if they were to lose all their money, best believe their insecurity would go through the roof. Now, here's the thing. A lot of us have bits and pieces of these different money scripts, these different narratives, and we all have very different behaviors around money. So again, falling into one of these scripts is not inherently bad. You're a product of your environment. So when it comes to flexing or showing off your status, where is the financial red flag here? In my opinion, this is an opinion, the financial red flag isn't about the part where you like money, right? You can like money. I believe money is a tool that has so much power to impact your quality of life in the current world that we live in. Where I think there's a potential financial red flag is when people overly flex or they base their entire identity around status. Q Leo. <laughs> Leo from season seven, off the bat in the first episode of the season, he said that he did not want women to like him just for his money. So I get it, it's an edited show. The way Netflix edited this and showed it to us, on the surface it seemed fine. Leo basically shared, one of my biggest insecurities is that a girl only wants me for money. So us, the audience watching the show, Maybe some of us are like, cool, you've let us, the viewers know why you're here on the show. You want someone to get to know you without knowing anything about you, including your finances. I think celebrities and a lot of rich people have this happen a lot too, because it's hard for them to know if people just want them for their money or if they are in it because they truly feel a connection. 
They wanted us to think like, okay, he's here for good, genuine reasons. Wrong. This dude, Leo, proceeded to talk about his money any opportunity he could, whether that was on the pod dates with all of the women or the other guys on the show. Now, at first, when I was watching it, I thought it was gray area. I thought like, cool, he was just sharing his background with people. He was talking about how he lost his parents and his grandparents and it was very tragic, but through all of that, he actually got an inheritance. He inherited his family's business as an art dealer. So one could argue like, okay, he's just proud of his occupation and you know, everyone talks about work all the time and what they do. But then it started seeming like that's what he led with. It was so tied to his identity. It gave me very heavy money status vibes where it seemed like his self-worth really came from his net worth. By the way, my internet sleuthing still hasn't found out his exact net worth, but if you know it, drop it in the comments, let me know. Now, from a binge watcher perspective, if you are a Netflix binge watcher, I was appalled. I was like, you can't say that you don't want a woman to want you for money, and then you're over here telling them about how much money you have. <laughs> like, it was out of control how much he was divulging about himself in terms of how much money he had. Now, from the perspective of a financial counselor, I actually will say that I have empathy for him. Like we all have different money stories and experiences growing up that shape us. So I couldn't tell you, I don't know what he learned or didn't learn. And I don't know much about the tragedies in his life and how that impacted how he sees the world. So my two cents here is it's nothing like to run away from, but just be aware that sometimes people heavily identify with their money or their worldly possessions, or things basically outside here, right? Outside what's in your body internally, your mind, body, and soul, your heart. Like those are things theoretically that a lot of people want to be liked for, right? You get in a relationship, you want people to like your character, your personality, they, you want them to like who you are. But in the real world, we often take other factors into consideration, right? Where does this person live? What job do they have? What car do they drive? I don't think there's anything wrong with having your preferences from a compatibility standpoint, but whether it's you giving off certain financial messages or you seeing it in others, take the phase of getting to know someone as information gathering. Be aware of potential flags and you know, don't just be impressed when somebody shows up to a date with a Rolex or starts talking about their Rolex. Like take that in as information before you decide if you really like this person and wanna be with them. All right, financial red flag number three in this video is not wanting to have the prenup discussion. So let's clear this up up front. I'll talk about what a prenup is, but I'm not saying that getting a prenup is right for every couple. It really just depends on your situation. But what I do think is there tends to be a lot of misconceptions about what a prenup is and what it does. And as such, all those misconceptions lead to a lot of heavy emotions around the discussion of a prenup. So let's bring it to basics. Let's define what it is. A prenup is short for prenuptial agreement. It's basically a legal contract signed by a couple before marriage, but it's a contract that both sides have to agree upon before they sign it. Usually each side has a lawyer to help draft the agreement and review it to make sure that it works for both people, that no one's getting you know, totally screwed, or just to make sure that their client understands what it's saying, and also to make sure that there's nothing in it that's not enforceable. Because if there's anything in the prenup that actually goes against whatever the law is, then it can make the whole thing invalid. So misconceptions, a prenup basically outlines how assets and debts will be divided in the event of divorce or death. So people think that if we get a prenup, it means that so-and-so is not gonna leave me anything. Like I'm not gonna have anything if we divorce or if they die. But a prenup can also specify financial responsibilities during the marriage. It can have a clear structure around finances. One of the big upsides of getting one is that in order to have one that's actually valid, you have to have full financial disclosures. So both sides, both people getting married have to fully be honest about 
all of their assets and debts. So that includes how much they owe in loans, but it also includes how much money they have across all their accounts. They can't hide money from you going into the marriage and they can't hide debts from you. So here's something that I learned is, guess what? If you don't have a prenup and you end up getting married, technically you have a prenup. It's not called that, but it's your state's laws. Your state's laws will determine when it comes to marriage, how your property is gonna be owned and titled and how assets would be shared if you were to divorce or if you die. So not having one means you're just subject to whatever your state's laws are. So if you opt to not get one, at the very least, you wanna understand how it is managed where you live. All right, let's talk about Love is Blind. That's what you're here for. The financial red flag I wanna call out was on Love is Blind UK. So this was when Freddie brought up a prenup with Kat. She wasn't happy about it. And then especially when she told her friends that he mentioned it, her friends were also super offended by it. So again, this is a very nuanced example. We have this engaged couple who just met a couple weeks ago about to get married. And you have one person, Freddie, who clearly has some assets. I think he owned a home or something. And he was being practical. He knew that he had an emotional connection with this woman, but didn't know much yet about the financial side. And I think to him, having the prenup was also a form of probably insurance in his mind that he wasn't just gonna marry someone, it wasn't gonna work out, and he was gonna lose you know, everything that he worked for. Later on, I think he mentioned that it was important for him that his house go to his sister if he died. And I don't know how the law works in the UK. I'm actually not a lawyer myself, so quick disclaimer, I'm not a lawyer. But technically, that's the kind of stuff you would put in a will rather than a prenup. But that's beyond the point. The point is he brought up prenup and she was not having it. It kind of changed the whole dynamic of their connection. So I mentioned it earlier. The prenup, in my opinion, in itself, isn't the problem. But I do wanna point out, there are benefits to both parties to consider one. That's just beyond the scope of this video. What I felt the red flag was, was that Kat was not willing to hear him out or learn about prenups or understand why it was important to him. She didn't get a lawyer. She didn't ask someone to explain to her what that meant. Instead, her reaction just felt more ignorant, in my opinion, and it felt like it was just based on her own understanding of what this contract actually is. And of course, there was a lot of emotions tied to her reaction of this contract. The thing is, marriage too is a contract <laughs> and a prenup is another contract. I think at the very least, it would have been nice if she understood what it was for because at the end of the day, she could have just not signed it or learned more about what it meant for finances in the future. Quick story, unrelated to Love is Blind, but it is another kind of Netflix related person. But Ali Wong, the comedian, she apparently signed a prenup before her wedding and it was mostly due to her fiance's family wanting to make sure that there were some boundaries around you know, all of the assets that he had. So she signed the prenup, they got married, they were married for a while. Her career started to spring up. She started making more than him. And then they ended up getting divorced. And it's one of these cases where going into the marriage, she had less assets. In the marriage, she had way more. You wouldn't have been able to predict that. I think a lot of times people assume there's gonna be one breadwinner in a marriage and the other person's always going, like one person's always gonna make more than the other person, but that's not always the case. As you know, life is up and down. We don't know who's gonna get laid off, who's gonna get a big break. And in her situation, the prenup worked in her favor, even though it was initially her ex-husband's family who were kind of pushing him to get one. So anyway, in this Freddie and Kat situation, who knows? Like. I don't know her financial situation, but not having the discussion and not trying to learn more to me was the red flag because you want to have these discussions. You want to be able to talk to your partner about money. And that includes different conversations about how you want to own your assets, how you want to manage them, and what you want to happen with those assets during your life and even after your life. To me, it is a compatibility thing. And yes, they're incompatible because Kat didn't want a prenup and Freddie did, 
But I think the bigger incompatibility there was that they were unable to talk about money in a way that took both of their values into consideration. Spoiler alert, they didn't get married. Freddie ended up saying no at the altar. Well, I hope you liked this video. It is a little different than my usual, but if you liked it, don't forget to let me know in the comments. I'm happy to make more. There are so many things I can talk about on my channel related to money and building wealth. Whatever you guys need, I got you. Until next time, peace out.